Sponsored by Skillshare. What was the first thing you did in 2024? For some, it was uploading a copy of Steamboat Willie. You see, to prevent this film from entering the public domain, Disney had twice lobbied the U.S. Congress into extending the length of copyright protection. That's why when it enters the public domain earlier this year, people rushed to celebrate its liberation. Finally, everyone is free to remix this important piece of film history. Clearly, the internet is sick of the copyright system, particularly corporate-controlled copyright. Many of us still remember that time when Disney threatened to sue daycare centers for displaying murals of Mickey and Pals. It's not a stretch to say that today, corporations have control over nearly every bit of our pop culture. But things weren't always like this. Back in a more innocent time, the world was bigger. Copyright infringement was not only common but international, colorful, and sometimes beloved by audiences. It was a different time with different movies, and today I want to take a look at it. Let's see why these knockoff films were loved, and discuss the strange upside of worldwide copyright infringement. Supposedly, Hong Kong schlockmeister Wang Zheng was a big fan of the Street Fighter games. Hence why, when making City Hunter, he went and acquired the official character licenses just for a gag. <laughs> he was hoping he could use this opportunity to launch an official adaptation down the line, but Hollywood bought the film rights before he could, resulted in the JCVD masterpiece instead. Unsatisfied with the outcome, Wang Jing decides to just do it anyway. So he changed E Honda to the legally distinct. Toyota, and that's how Future Cops, a knockoff movie, became a childhood favorite of many Chinese kids. Indeed, throughout the late 20th century, Japan was the king of cultural influence in East Asia. Conscious or not, people from surrounding nations look on with envy, wishing that they could compete. This mentality is partly the reason why Inframan was made. It was Hong Kong's attempt at making Kamen Rider slash Ultraman. The same influence also resulted in the legally dubious Thailand Ultraman, as well as South Korea's Robot Taekwon V, a knockoff of Mazinga Z, made to circumvent the Japanese product ban at the time. When talking about international copyright infringement, I immediately think of Turkish Star Wars, a Turkish fantasy action film with footage and music lifted directly from Lucas Arts movies. Less known but no less infringing is Turkish Star Trek, which looks colorful and well made. Turkey was a big player in the copyright infringement genre, producing films with amazing production value with extremely limited budgets. The badly deteriorated film print gave the internet an unflattering impression of Turkish Star Wars. But back in the day, these were glorious mockbusters adored by the Turkish audience. Here we have Filipino Batman. And it is a musical comedy. Oh, f it's looping in my head again. Batman spoof is kind of a tradition in the Philippines, it seems. This is not the first, not even the second or third unlicensed Batman movie made in the country. In fact, unlicensed superhero movies were incredibly common around the world. Mexican Batwoman is a classic, but there's also multiple versions of Indian Superman. The best use of the character, however, isn't even from a Superman movie, but merely a song and dance sequence borrowing Superman for comedic effects. While Japan was being copied, its anime industry does its share of infringement as well. Lupin the Third made use of the name Arsène Lupin without permission, as Japan did not enforce trade copyrights for a time. And who can forget Dragon Ball Z, which blatantly rips up Superman's backstory? Not to mention, whatever this is. I think Ridley Scott's gonna sue somebody. What are you talking about? <laughs> Finally, Italy was another big contributor to this genre. The Last Shark, as an example, is a straight remake of Jaws. But the biggest one is, of course, Italian Yojimbo. Don't think I need to explain this one.
This was how copyright worked for much of history. Before the internet, the reach of copyright was limited. Beyond that limit, opportunistic and daring artists could carve out their own little space for better or for worse. Regardless of your opinion on this phenomenon, there's no denying that many love the movies I mentioned, despite the dubious legality and morality. It seems a part of us are willing to look past copyright infringement. So what if we actually do that? Lately, I've been getting back into writing. Mainly a screenplay, hoping to get it produced. It has been a while since I last dabbled in fiction, however, and I need to shake off the rust. That's why I've been following this class, Get Ready to Write on Skillshare. Ah, yes, it has been a while. Let's do a refresher. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative minds, from illustration to graphic design, from photography to filmmaking. Skillshare's collection of classes helps you explore your creativity and hone your skills as a professional. The class I'm following by novelist Kathleen Barber teaches you how to develop a log line and a roadmap, breaking down a massive writing project into manageable parts, so you can start writing as soon as possible. If you like to learn like me, the first 500 people to use my link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Once you're set, why not explore a few learning paths? These are curated sets of classes that can take you from beginner to advanced in one fell swoop. Sticking with the topic of writing, here is a learning path about writing memorable characters, offering me multiple perspectives and techniques on something I'm not too confident in. Want to start a new hobby or becoming a pro in 2024? Skillshare is the community for you. I know it's very suspect for a Chinese dude to be publicly defending plagiarism, especially in light of recent YouTube events. But before you crucify me, let's consider the opposite end of the spectrum, where copyright lasts forever. Using an example raised by the patron saint of YouTubers, Tom Scott, perpetual copyright means an individual or a corporation would have the final say as to how Shakespeare is interpreted as well as who gets to represent it. To be or not to be. Not to be. Small community feeders for young actors, like the excellent Shakespeare in the Park here in Montreal, will not exist. It gives power to the ones who already hold power and stifles the emergence of new talent and new culture. My point is, just as Shakespeare should be free I think there should be a corner beyond the reach of Disney where children can draw Mickey Mouse and show it to the world. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, if Shakespeare isn't available, why not make something wholly original? If you went to art school, you'll probably be familiar with the phrase, everything is a remix. Mimesis is a philosophical concept that seeks to explain how arts and culture are created. To put it simply, humanity's creativity is fundamentally a form of mimicry. We learn languages, drawings, acting by imitating others, and everything we create must be derived from something. The highest form of art, as proposed by Plato, is the form least removed from the Platonic ideal, a direct imitation of nature. But not all artists, especially not beginners, are capable of doing such. Think back to the beginning of our artistic journey. How often do we practice by mimicking someone else's work? How long did it take for us to cross that threshold until our craft can be considered original? Thus, copyright protection is a balancing act. It must allow enough resources for emerging talents to build upon, while also protect the creation of existing artists. Collectively, our society have determined that things like ideas and styles cannot be copyrighted. These are fair to use by everyone. White House Down is just die hard in the White House, but it is a different way to mimic the same idea. Thus, we consider it fair. Yet to me, the distinction between fair and unfair was merely a matter of degree. Some of the lesser legal infringements still seem fair enough to be loved. This fairness is what I'm interested in.
In 1907, French author Maurice Leblanc released a short story collection, which contains a story called "Sherlock Holmes Arrives Too Late." In this story, Leblanc pitted his gentleman thief Arsène against famous detective Sherlock Holmes, and outwitting him at the end. The entire shtick was unlicensed. Arthur Conan Doyle's lawyer protested, so Leblanc renamed him Sherlock Holmes. In a sense, Leblanc stole Sherlock. And I thought it was the funniest thing. You see, LeBlanc and his gentleman thief genre is oddly a great guide on how to be fair while committing intellectual property theft. Hear me out. Number one, announce your thievery. Just as Arsène sends out a calling card beforehand, the most fair movies also makes themselves abundantly clear from whom they stole from. For these works, stealing isn't a shortcut for a profit. Rather, the act of stealing itself is the entertainment. There is no original alternative to this kind of creations. The joke is about stealing. Without stealing, there is no joke. Number two, steal from the rich. We celebrate the freeing of Willie because we like to stick it to the man. But it's not just big companies. It's also about cultural relevancy. The reason there are so many alternate Superman out there is because by this point, Superman is like Sherlock. He's so well known and well established, he feels like he should be in the public domain already. There's practically zero risk of your work doing any damage to Superman. Stealing is like comedy. It's only funny when you are punching up. Speaking of which, number three, have a sense of humor. Steal it for the lows. I can't breathe in this thing. Taking something for the sake of parody is, as far as I know, entirely legal in the U.S. I love you in Wall Street. Hashtag not legal advice. Indeed, if you think of this as a prank, then it is only successful if your audience thinks it is funny. A gentleman thief steals for the poor. Stealing for personal gain is not seen as fair. Number four, steal not rob. A gentleman thief only takes the gem, not the entire life saving. Stealing an idea is perfectly legal. Stealing a character is not, but it's more fair than stealing the entire story. That's what fan themes often are. Take a beloved character and make your own stories around it. Steal only the bits you need and use that to express your own voice. Not all of the films we listed today have all these qualities, and sometimes a film is just loved anyway. The point is, our sense of fairness varied across people, and it differs from our current copyright law. It's copyright infringement to use this photo for memes, yet it feels like it should be part of pop culture, freely accessible by individuals. It is now okay to remix Stimble Willie, yet we still have to tread so carefully. Because Mickey Mouse is a trademark, the line between borrowing and stealing, between acceptable and unacceptable, is never as clear cut. What we assumed to be fair may only feel that way because it is the status quo. Of course, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not smart enough to offer a solution all on my own. But before we call it quit, let's talk about one last thing: H.P. Lovecraft. Throughout much of his life, famed horror writer H.P. Lovecraft cared little about copyright. He frequently encouraged his peers to borrow from his work, allowing them to contribute to his mythos, resulting in loads of Lovecraftian stories written not by Lovecraft. It sounds like a copyright nightmare. A poor writer without influence, having his brilliant works out in the open for anyone to copy and steal. Yet, despite all that, his works have remained influential in the past hundred years. In fact, his creation persisted, likely because other writers keep on feeding it new materials. The fear of his name being erased by copycats didn't actually happen. Every time I think about this story, I can't help but imagine an alternate system. In this alternate world, artists are supported. We are free of financial worries. We can publish our writings for passion rather than money, and James Somerton would cite his sources. In this world, stories come to life. 
contributed by everyone, like folk tales of old, the most enduring, the most beloved form of creation. That's not so bad, is it?